Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology. In this video I'm going to be going through animal and plant cells, the different organelles and what their functions are. So first of all we've got here our two examples of eukaryotic cells for GCSE. We have a plant cell and an animal cell. And if you haven't already seen my video on eukaryotic cells compared to prokaryotic cells, I'll link it up here so you can go and take a look. So some of the key structures inside a eukaryotic cell are they have cytoplasm, they have a cell membrane, and they have genetic material that is within a nucleus rather than loose in the cytoplasm. Now we're going to go into more detail on the different structures and what their functions are though in the animal cells and the plant cells. So let's start with an animal cell. So we said they have cytoplasm, cell membrane, but they also have mitochondria. They have a nucleus, which we said contains the genetic information, and they have ribosomes. And we're gonna go through the function of these a little bit later in the video. Now, if we compare this to a plant cell, they do have lots of structures in common. So they also have cytoplasm, they have a cell membrane, they have mitochondria. Now notice here, I've called it mitochondrion. That's because it's only pointing to one and the singular is mitochondrion. The plural is mitochondria. They have a cell wall. They have a permanent vacuole, which is filled with sap, a liquid. They have chloroplasts a nucleus which contains the genetic information and ribosomes. Now, out of all of those structures inside of a plant cell, it's actually only these three which you only find in a plant cell. And that is quite a common question for this topic at GCSC, is either being able to label the structures in an animal or a plant cell, um, or it could be suggesting structures that you find in a plant cell that you do not find in an animal cell. And these would be your three potential marks for that question. So we focus on now what the actual functions are of these different structures. So we talked about cytoplasm, and this is a liquid gel, so it's quite a thick liquid. And this is what the organelles are suspended in. And what we mean by organelle is the different structures you find within the cell. So these structures or organelles are floating in this thick liquid. It's also where most chemical reactions take place. The cell membrane, this is the layer surrounding the cells that you have in both an animal cell and a plant cell. And that layer controls what can enter and exit the cell. So that's what we mean by it's controlling the passage of substances. The nucleus, so this is where you find the genetic material, and it controls the activities of the cell as well as containing the genetic material. The mitochondria, this is where aerobic respiration occurs, and that means that most of the energy from a cell is released from the mitochondria. Ribosomes, this is where protein synthesis occurs, so that is where all the proteins for the cell are made. Chloroplasts, which you only find in plants, the reason they're green is because they contain a pigment, which is a protein which has a colour. They contain this pigment called chlorophyll. And chlorophyll absorbs the energy from light, and that energy is used in photosynthesis. So chloroplasts' function is for photosynthesis, which is how plants make their food. The cell wall, which you only find in the plant cells, not the animal cells, contains a molecule called cellulose. And that molecule makes the cell wall really, really strong. So it gives the cell support. And it's that cellulose cell wall, which is really strong, which stops the plant cells from bursting if they do swell up with lots of water. The permanent vacuole. So this is filled with cell sap, so that is a liquid. And that liquid, again, it helps to support the cell and make it really rigid. So you have that liquid in the centre pushing outwards to make the cell 
really rigid. I'm going to be going through prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells in this video for GCSE biology. So let's have a look then at some of the key differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Now, first of all, just to let you know, this is just a way to group cells based on similarities or differences in their structures. So eukaryotic cells, this is plant and animal cells, and you'll be familiar with that from key stage three. Whereas prokaryotic cells, that would be bacteria cells. Some of the key structures that you have in animal and plant cells, which are our eukaryotic cells, are the cell membranes, they have cytoplasm, and this is the key one here. Their genetic material, so the DNA, is found in the nucleus. And if we compare this to a prokaryotic cell, like bacteria, first of all, they are much, much smaller in size. So bacteria cells are much smaller than plant and animal cells. But also, there are some differences. There are some similarities, though, also. So they do both have cytoplasm. They both have cell membranes. Now, only plant cells have a cell wall, whereas all the prokaryotic cells will have a cell wall. The big difference is prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. They do still have genetic material, which sometimes is DNA, but you will just find that as a single loop loose within the cytoplasm. They also sometimes have an extra circular loop of DNA, which is called a plasmid. So if you were asked in an exam question to identify similarities between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, the best two to go for would be cell membranes and cytoplasm, because that is consistent across plants, animals and bacterial cells. If you were asked in an exam question to point out a difference between these two types of cells, the best option would be, for say, would be to say that eukaryotic cells have a nucleus that contains genetic material, whereas prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus and their genetic material is just a single loop which you find in the cytoplasm. So if we have a look then at these two different types of cells, and we said eukaryotic cells are plant cells and animal cells. So the cytoplasm is the liquid part that we can see here. The cell membrane is the layer which controls the passage of substances into and out of a cell. And then inside of the nucleus, that is where you find the genetic material. Now you'll notice that there are other structures here, so mitochondria and ribosomes, but I go into detail on that in another video. And I'll link that up here, so if you do want to see that GCSE video looking at plant and animal cells in more detail, go and take a look. So prokaryotic cells, we said bacterial cells. Now they do still have a cytoplasm, which is the site of most chemical reactions. They have a cell membrane, which is the layer that controls what can enter and exit the cell. They also have a cell wall to provide some structural support. And here is their genetic material, which we said is a single loop. Now it looks a bit more complicated than that, just because it's a very big loop, which is quite tangled up. But the key thing is it's not found inside of a nucleus. Some bacteria also have a plasmid, which is this circular loop of DNA. Now you do not always find plasmids, so that's only sometimes in bacteria. And you might notice these tail-like structures. These are flagella, and those are again only sometimes found and they're to help the bacteria to swim and move around. So because it's only sometimes found, you wouldn't get a mark for necessarily saying that. You would get marks for pointing out the key structures which are always present, which is cytoplasm, cell membrane, cell wall, and genetic material in a single loop, but not inside of a nucleus. Now I said that bacteria cells or prokaryotic cells are much, much smaller. So let's have a look at this scale to put that into context. So here is the eukaryotic cell, and that can range between 100 micrometers to 10 micrometers. So some cells are much bigger. So for example, a human egg cell is a much larger cell. Prokaryotic cells, are around one micrometer. 
So they can be around 100 times smaller in size. So it is a big difference. Now, other things just to point out on this scale, you will learn within the GCSE about different microscopes, a light microscope and an electron microscope. And this is just showing you compared to what you can see with your human eye, so as in with no assisted help, just with your eye, compared to what you could see using a light microscope. And those are the microscopes that you typically have in school. An electron microscope is much, much more powerful, has a higher magnification and a higher resolution, and they're much more expensive, so you would not have one of these in school. But because they have a higher resolution and magnification, you're able to see much, much smaller objects um, and they're still clear. In this video, we're going to be covering a GCSE topic on cell specialisation. Now, in this lesson, what I'm going to be covering is what we mean by a cell, tissue, organ and organ systems and then the whole organism. The reason for that is you need to know what all of those structures mean before we then look at the next part. And that is how different cells are specialized for their function. And the list of cells we're gonna go through are those that are required for AQA biology. So first of all then, let's have a look at what we mean by these different levels of organization. And this comes up later in the GCSE. And what we mean by organization is how all the different parts of a body, or it could be a plant, are organized. So cells are the basic building blocks of all living organisms. Then the next largest thing is a tissue. And that's a group of cells with a similar structure and function. Tissues then will all work together to make an organ. So organs are aggregations or groups of tissues performing a specific function. Organs are then organized into organ systems. So we can see in this diagram, the circulatory system, which is made up of the heart and then arteries, veins, capillaries. And lastly, the entire organism is made up of lots of organ systems. So that's what we mean by organization. Now, if we go on to the different specialised cells you need to know. So we're going to start with the animal cells and firstly a sperm cell. Now, for all the specialised cells, you need to know what the function is and how the structure of the cell links to that. So the function of the sperm cell is to swim to reach the egg, carry the genetic material and fertilise that egg. So the structures that are in place are, first of all, we can see this long tail and that will whip back and forth so that it can swim and move towards the egg cell. In this bit of the sperm, so in the middle section, there's lots and lots of mitochondria. And that is so that energy can be released and that energy is then used for the tail to move. The acrosome is this little part right at the top of the head and that contains digestive enzymes. So when the sperm does reach the egg, those digestive enzymes are released and it breaks down the outer layer so the sperm's nucleus can then combine with the egg cells. Lastly, it does have a large nucleus and that's because it contains half the genetic material that is required to make the new offspring. So next cell is a muscle cell. The function of this is for contracting and relaxing, so in the skeleton or around the skeleton, it's so that those bones can move. You do also have muscles lining certain organs. So for example, the stomach will have stomach muscles which contract and relax to help churn up food. So the structure, there are muscle fibers that are made up of two different proteins. And those proteins slide over each other. And as they slide together, that makes the muscle contract. And as they slide back apart, that makes the muscle relax. Now to be able to do that, energy is required. So there are lots of stores of glycogen, and that is lots of glucose molecules bonded and stored away. So that means that when respiration is required, to release energy for the muscles to contract, that glycogen store can be broken down to release the glucose needed for respiration. Now lastly, aerobic respiration happens in the mitochondria. So you also find lots of mitochondria in the muscle cells. Last animal cell is the nerve cell. So the function of nerve cells or neurons 
is to carry electrical impulses around the body really, really quickly so that you can respond to your surroundings. The structures then are, first of all, we have lots of these dendrites and these are the branching parts coming off the nerve cell. And there's lots of them so that they can make connections with lots of other nerve cells. So the impulse or this message can be passed around the body rapidly. The axon is this long, thin wire section, and it's a bit like an electrical wire. It carries the electrical impulse. You then will have gaps between the endings of the nerve and between another nerve, and we call those gaps synapses. And at that point, you will have the message being sent as a chemical impulse or message. So then if we go on to the plant cells, First of all, we're going to be looking at this group of plant cells that makes up the xylem tissue. So the whole xylem is a tissue uh, because it's made up of lots and lots of cells working together. But if we think about the structure of those and the function, we can see on the diagram the function is to carry water around the plant. And there will be dissolved mineral ions within that water. So it transports water and mineral ions from the roots where it's absorbed to the rest of the plant. It has lignin in the cell walls, which makes it really strong so that it doesn't fall down or um, break under the high pressure of water moving through it. We can see as well that it forms this hollow tube, a bit like a hose pipe, so that water can move through it really easily. So the inside of those xylem cells is actually dead and that's why it's empty. So phloem cells, we can see that next to the xylem. The function of these phloem cells is to transport sugars that have been made in the leaf in photosynthesis around the plant. The structures then, hopefully you can see here this perforated, which just means there's lots of holes in it, this perforated cell wall. And we call it a sieve plate because it's a bit like a sieve, it's got lots of holes in. And that will allow the sugar solution to transport around the plant. Now it's also pretty hollow inside, so it is like almost like a hose pipe, apart from these sieve tube elements. And that means they have companion cells. So we've got these cells that line the phloem, which we call companion cells because they help the phloem cell. So they will have mitochondria in to provide the energy that the phloem cells need because the phloem cell itself doesn't have mitochondria within it. So the last one is the root hair cell. The root hair cells are responsible for absorbing water and mineral ions from the soil. Water by osmosis, mineral ions by active transport. The adaptations then are, first of all, this shape. It's called a root hair cell because of that protruding structure that looks a bit like a hair and that provides a large surface area for active transport and osmosis. There is this large permanent vacuole as well, and that helps to increase the speed of water uptake by osmosis. Lastly, it contains lots of mitochondria, and that is to provide energy for active transport to uptake those mineral ions. In this GCSE biology video, we're gonna go through cell differentiation. So what we're going to go through today is what we mean by cell differentiation, why it's important, how cells differentiate, and just looking at the purpose of that process. So cell differentiation, what that means is that all animals and plants are unspecialized in the very early stages of development. So if you think about a human in the very early stages when they're just a ball of cells or an embryo, that ball of cells is called stem cells, or it contains stem cells. And those are cells that don't have any adaptations yet, so they're not specialised. Now, when they do become specialised, we call that differentiation. So they've become different. They differentiate into lots of different types of specialised cells. So we can see here we've got a nerve cell, red blood cells, and other cells. So that is what we mean by cell differentiation. So cell differentiation in animals, this happens very, very early in the development for animals. And that's what we're seeing here. 
we've got just the zygote initially, so that is the cell that forms after a sperm and egg cell fuse. Then, after a few days, we get the cells dividing until you just have a ball of cells, which is the embryo. Uh, by the time that a human is a baby, so being given birth to, they already have almost all of their specialised cells. And that happens by genes being switched on or off. So that each specialised cell creates a specific selection of proteins within that cell. Now those specialised cells will mainly divide by mitosis to make more of those specialised cells. But by the time you are an adult and fully grown, mitosis is actually no longer for growth because you're fully grown. But instead, mitosis is just for repairing any damaged cells or replacing damaged cells. Now, in contrast, in plants, cell differentiation happens at different times. Most plants can actually continue to differentiate even after early development. The undifferentiated cells, or the stem cells, are found at these actively growing regions, and we call those regions that are continuously growing meristems. Stems and roots, or the tips of the stem and the tips of the roots, are meristems, and that means that there's constant mitosis happening at those regions for growth. So because of that, you can actually take a cutting from the tip of a root or a shoot, plant it in soil with some plant hormones, and from that tiny cutting, an entire new plant would grow. And that's because all of those cells were undifferentiated, and therefore they could then become specialised to make a whole new plant. In this video, we're going to be finding out about microscopes. So in this lesson, we're going to be looking at how microscopy techniques have developed over time, how electron microscopy has increased the understanding of the inside structures of a cell, and looking at what we mean by magnification and resolution, and how those differ between light and electron microscopes. So you do need to know a little bit about the history of the microscope. You could be asked to label the different structures and the parts of a microscope because it is one of your required practicals to know how to use a microscope. So we've got that there on this image. Now light microscopes were actually first developed in the mid 17th century. So they have been around for a long time. And cells are very, very small. They're the basic building blocks that make up all organisms but most of them can only actually be seen with a microscope because they're so small. Microscopes continue to develop, and it was in the 1930s that the electron microscope was developed. Now, the electron microscope has a much higher magnification and resolving power compared to the light microscope. And we'll go through later on what those two terms mean. But what it meant for the use of microscopes is we were now able not just to see the cells, but to see the inside of cells. And we call that the subcellular structures. So if we have a look at some of the properties of light microscopes. So the way they work is a beam of light is used to create the image. They can magnify up to 2000 times. So that means whatever you're looking at can be viewed 2000 times bigger. That's the microscope that you'll be using in your school. And there's two reasons why. First of all, they're much cheaper and they're much easier to use. With the light microscope, you can actually view living and non-living specimens. And that's what we can see over here. The top diagram, we have a live nematode worm. And down here at the bottom, this is actually a live leech that we're looking at. You can also see that you can get colour images with the light microscope but we can't really see the details of the cells or any individual cells. And that's where the electron microscope is much, much more useful. Now, the way it creates an image is by releasing a beam of electrons. Now, electrons have a much shorter wavelength than light, and that is why that we get this much higher magnification. We can actually magnify two million times. They are very, very big and expensive and much more complicated to use. You can't actually use live specimens on these microscopes. 
The reason for that you learn at A level, but essentially it's because you have to have a vacuum for this microscope to work. And a vacuum is when you've removed all of the air. So you couldn't have anything living in that. The images that are produced are always black and white. You can though artificially color that image in Photoshop, for example, and that's what we can see in this diagram above. They've put colors onto that black and white image. Now there's two different types of electron microscopes. There's one that's called a transmission electron microscope, and that's what we can see down here at the bottom, the results of. You get these 2D images. A scanning electron microscope gives a 3D image, and that's what we can see on the top one, this 3D image of E. coli and cocci bacteria. The lower image from the transmission electron microscope has got this image of mitochondria, which are the subcellular structures. Now, if we have a look at what these two key terms, magnification and resolution, actually mean, magnification is how many times bigger the image looks compared to the actual size object. Resolution is the ability to see two different points as separate. And basically, that is to do with how crisp and clear the image looks. So the higher the resolving power of a microscope, the more detail you can see in your image. And that's why the electron microscopes, you are able to see these subcellular structures in detail because you can magnify more and you have this higher resolution so you get a clearer image. So just to show you the comparison, the resolving power, which is linked to the resolution, the resolving power of the light microscope is 200 nanometers. The scanning electron microscope is 10 nanometers and a transmission electron microscope is 0.2 nanometers. So that means you can still see two objects as separate when they are only the distance away from each other of two atoms. So that is a very, very high resolving power. In this video, I'm going to be going through the GCSE required practical for inhibition zone. So keep watching to find out all about how and why to follow aseptic technique, how you then do the write-up and what the results show. Now in this investigation, we're going to be looking at which antibiotic or you might be using other antimicrobials to see which is the most effective at killing a particular bacteria. So just a reminder that antibiotics, these are medicines that can treat bacterial diseases by killing the bacteria. And in our experiment, we're going to be getting what's called inhibition zones. And these are the clear areas around the antibiotic disc or whatever it is that you have put down, where the bacteria that you grew has been killed by that particular antibiotic. And if you have no inhibition zone, that means that that antibiotic is ineffective or it does not kill that particular bacteria. Now, whenever we grow microbes, we have to make sure we are working aseptically and we follow what's called aseptic technique. And this is when we work in a way that's completely sterile and clean to make sure that we don't get any contamination on the Petri dish. So some examples are, making sure that you clean down your working surface with disinfectant before you begin, but also at the end to make sure you don't then transfer that bacteria to other surfaces within the school. We wash our hands with soap before and after, before to make sure we don't contaminate the Petri dish and after so we don't contaminate the rest of the school. We work near a Bunsen burner and that's because air will be drawn upwards as it gets hot following the convection currents and then as it goes through the Bunsen flame that will kill any microbes in the air. As that air cools it will then go back down again and we'll get this circulation of air being sterilised. So if you work near the Bunsen burner when you have to take your lid off the air around you should be being sterilised. Any metal equipment we sterilise by putting into the Bunsen burner flame as well. And when you do have to open your Petri dish to put the antibiotic discs in and to put the bacteria in, as well as working near the Bunsen burner, try and only open the lid a little bit to reduce the chance of any microbes in the air landing on your plate. 
So aseptic technique is working, as we said, completely sterile. And this is so important because if you do get contaminations on your Petri dish, then the bacteria or maybe fungi that grows, it might actually outcompete the bacteria that you want to grow and examine. So it'll be competing for the available nutrients in the agar jelly, the water available in the agar jelly, and um, the space to grow or the new microbe might actually release chemicals that kill the bacteria you're growing. So let's watch the method then. First of all, you disinfect your work surface. Then we're gonna light the Bunsen burner. I've washed my hands there with an antiseptic and antibacterial gel, and then labeling the Petri dish with my initials, the date and E. coli, because that's the bacteria I'm growing. I also split it into three so that we can see where to place the discs. Now we're going to put on the bacteria and straight away we are sterilizing the syringe. I've now got a sterile spreader and I'm spreading it evenly all over the plate. I'm working near the Bunsen burner where the sterile air is. Next then we're using sterile forceps to put our three antimicrobials on in the three positions that we've already sectioned out on the Petri dish. Sterilize again, just in case you've got any E. coli on. And then we're putting tape just on two sides so oxygen can still get in for the bacteria and then aseptic technique at the end. So let's have a look at the results then. Unfortunately, my ones here, the bacteria didn't actually grow enough to be able to see these really clear inhibition zones. So here was my antibiotic. There was a slight inhibition zone, but you just can't really see it in this picture. And there was a slight one around my antiseptic. Garlic though, there was no inhibition zone. And in fact, even more bacteria started to grow around that. So we're gonna use these results instead because although it's just a diagram, it's useful to be able to practice the skill of the area of a circle and coming to a conclusion. So let's work out then the area of the inhibition zones. What you would need to do for this is use a ruler with millimetre markings on and then from the very centre of your paper disc to the outer layer of your inhibition zone you would measure to get the radius or if you're going to do the diameter instead just make sure you are going directly through the middle of your paper disc. Once we've recorded those we can then work out the area of the inhibition zone. It's a circle, so it's pi r squared. And just make sure that you do record all of your results in the same column to the same number of decimal places. So now we've recorded our results, you could then be asked to describe, explain, or come to a conclusion based on your results. Now the description of these results is where you are just saying the patterns of what you can see. So we could say descriptions like there is an inhibition zone around A, B and D, but not around C. We have the largest inhibition zone around D and the smallest around B, not including C, which had zero. That would be our description. Now, I've actually linked the conclusion and explanations together over here. So one conclusion could be that A, B and D are all effective at killing this particular bacteria. The explanation is because they all had inhibition zones and that indicates that they had killed bacteria. Another conclusion is that antibiotic C does not kill the bacteria and the reason we know that, this is our explanation, is because there was no inhibition zone around it. Finally, we could have the conclusion that D is the most effective antibiotic out of these four at killing this particular bacteria. And the explanation is it had the largest inhibition zone, which means it had killed the most bacteria. In this video, I'm gonna be going through mitosis for GCSE biology. So have you ever found yourself wondering how new skin cells are made to heal a cut or how an embryo goes from being just a ball of cells to a fetus, how your fingernails grow or how plant roots grow? Well, if you have the answer to all of those is mitosis and that's what we're going to be going through today. So one type of cell division is mitosis and it's really important for growth and development of multicellular organisms like plants and animals. 
new cells that are grown must be identical to the original if they're going to be replacing or adding to the existing cells. And that's so that these new cells also perform exactly the same function. Now, when we say identical, we're meaning genetically identical. And genetically identical means that inside of the nucleus, they have exactly the same DNA. So the same chromosomes with the same genes and alleles on them. The cell cycle is split into three key stages. And within the cell cycle, the DNA doubles and then the cell divides. And that is how we get these two identical cells. So the three stages, the first one is the cell has to grow. If that cell is going to split in half to make new cells, then it has to grow first of all, so that every cell doesn't become smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's what we have as one of the main stages of the cell cycle. The cell gets bigger and all of the organelles, which are the internal cell structures, they also replicate. So things like the ribosomes and the mitochondria. As well as that, all of the DNA doubles. So DNA replication happens. So there's now two copies of every single chromosome. And that is so that when the cell does split in half, both of the new cells have the correct number of each chromosome, which in humans is 23 pairs or 46 in total. The last stage is the actual cell divides. So we have the cytoplasm splits and the cell membrane splits, and that is how we get our two new cells. So this is just showing you some of those stages. This cell has already gone through the first two steps, the cell growth and the DNA replication. And then we can see that the cytoplasm is starting to pinch inwards and starting to split, as is the cell membrane just hit until eventually it does split and we now have two identical cells to each other and they're also identical to the original cell that they're both made from. So where does mitosis occur? It happens in nearly all of your body cells. In fact, the only body cells that it doesn't happen in are the sex cells. So that would be your gametes. Um, that is where we don't have it occurring when we're making gametes. It does happen in particular in the root tips of dividing plants. And that's what we can see here. This is a root tip from a plant under the microscope. And at the very tip, that is where mitosis is happening. So the roots can continue to grow in length and reach lots of water. Another example is in humans when embryos are growing. So here we have the first cell, that'd be a zygote after a sperm and egg fuse. And all of these new cells that are doubling and replicating, that is by mitosis. Now, sometimes mitosis does go wrong. Usually mitosis happens absolutely as it should because there are controls in place to make sure that your cells are replicating only when you need new cells and at a speed that is appropriate. However, sometimes those controls stop working and that will then mean that a cell can divide uncontrollably by mitosis and you end up with far more cells than you actually need. And that is what a tumor is. It's a group of cells that have been created by this uncontrollable division. Now, some tumors are benign, which means they're not cancerous. Some are malignant, which means they are cancerous. In this video, we're gonna go through stem cells for GCSE biology. So first of all, what do we mean by a stem cell? These are undifferentiated cells which have the ability to continually replicate into the same type of cell but can also differentiate, which means to become a specialised cell. Plants have stem cells and these are found in the meristems and that's what we call the actively growing parts of a plant. So for example, the tips of the roots and the growing regions in the stem. They can differentiate into any plant cell throughout their entire life. In contrast, adults, we do have stem cells, but we find them in limited places, such as the bone marrow. And these bone marrow cells, which are stem cells, 
They can differentiate into different cells, but only a small number of different types of cells, um, which are the blood cells. Now, in humans and other animals, the most useful stem cells are embryonic stem cells. And these are found in very, very young embryos. So this is shortly after the sperm and egg fertilize and you just have a group of cells. Now, those stem cells have the ability to grow and divide rapidly into any type of cell. So this just summarizes the three types of stem cells we said. You might want to pause and note this down. I'm just going to pick out some of the potential uses and the disadvantages. For plants, you could use these stem cells to make clones or cuttings. And this is a way of growing plants very, very quickly and cheaply because instead of planting seeds and waiting for them to grow, you can cut off a section of the plant and that will then grow the new cells needed, such as roots, to make a new plant. And this is really useful as a way to prevent the extinction of rare species or being able to create special crops that you're after. Adult stem cells, we said, can only differentiate into a small number of cells, for example, blood cells. Now, this can still be useful because it can be used to treat a range of blood diseases. But because these stem cells can only differentiate into blood cells, it is a small number of diseases that these adult stem cells can be used to treat. And also the mechanism behind how you do this can involve viruses. So that means you could transfer a viral infection as well. Embryonic stem cells, because they can differentiate into any type of cell, they could be used to treat a wide range of diseases because you would then allow the stem cell to differentiate into a particular specialized cell to replace faulty ones. For example, you could replace cells in the pancreas to treat diabetes and you could replace damaged neurons in the spine to treat paralysis. The downside though is in doing this, taking the stem cells from an embryo, it destroys the embryo, which involves lots of ethical and religious concerns. You would also have to make sure that the stem cells that you're using to treat a patient are identical to the stem cells from the embryo. And the only way this is possible is if you make a clone of your patient. And that is what we mean by therapeutic cloning. Now, therapeutic cloning doesn't mean that you then let the embryo go full term to birth and you create a mini me. That's not what therapeutic cloning is. It's when you just clone a patient to get an embryo, which you can then use the stem cells for to treat certain diseases. And the way this is done is we remove nucleus from the patient and we put that nucleus into an empty egg cell. And that is the equivalent of fertilization. So that clone, which is now just our embryo, has identical DNA to the patient. The stem cells are then removed from that cloned embryo and they can then be treated with particular hormones and chemicals to say that the cells will differentiate into particular specialized cells. That can then be used to treat whatever the disease is and the patient's body won't reject those cells because they're a clone of their own. So this could be used to treat medical conditions like diabetes. Now, there are pros and cons of this idea of using embryonic stem cells. Some of the advantages we've said, you can use them to treat many diseases. You can grow lots of embryos in a lab. And in terms of the embryo, this is a completely painless technique for the embryo. The disadvantages are though, although it doesn't hurt the embryo, it will cause permanent harm or death of that embryo. The embryo can't give consent and also it might not even work. Stem cells have this property of replicating rapidly. So sometimes even when the stem cells are then put into the patient, it can replicate so much that it forms a tumor. So embryonic stem cells is not a perfect science at all. And you need to be aware of the pros and the cons of potentially using stem cells. In this video, I'm going through diffusion for GCSE biology. So diffusion is a type of transport and it's how some substances cross the cell membrane into a cell or move out of a cell. 
So have you ever thought about why is it possible if you're in your bedroom that you can smell dinner cooking? Or why the smell of an air freshener is all around the house? Well, the answer is diffusion. Diffusion is the spreading out of particles in either a solution, so in a liquid, or a gas. And they move from an area of high concentration to a lower concentration. So we can see here we've got this high concentration of particles on one side of the membrane and they diffuse or move across the cell membrane to where there is a lower concentration. And this movement happens until you reach equilibrium, which means you've got the same concentration on both sides or in all locations. So examples of where this happens in biology. Oxygen and carbon dioxide move by diffusion in gas exchange. So in the alveoli, oxygen diffuses from inside the alveoli into the blood capillaries and carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood capillaries back into the alveoli to be exhaled. Urea, which is a waste product, diffuses from the cells where it's made into the blood plasma and then it's transported to the kidneys to be removed. So what factors will increase the rate of diffusion? There's three. The difference in concentration gradients, the temperature and the surface area of the membrane. So the difference in concentrations is the concentration gradient. And the steeper the gradient, the faster diffusion will happen. And it's a bit like we can see here, these snowballs rolling down the hill. The steeper the gradient of the hill, the faster they're going to roll down. And it's the same idea with particles moving in diffusion. The higher the concentration in one area, the faster those particles will diffuse to the area where there's a lower concentration. Secondly is temperature. The higher the temperature, the more kinetic energy the particles have. And kinetic energy is movement energy. So if those particles are moving faster, then diffusion will happen faster. Lastly is the surface area of the membrane. So this only applies to if it's diffusion across a membrane. So the larger the surface that particles can diffuse across, the faster it will happen because there's more space for those particles to move through. This video, I'm going to be going through osmosis for GCSE biology. So let's start by looking at the definition. Osmosis is a type of transport, but it is only the movement of water. And specifically in the exam, you'd need to say it's the diffusion of water. Now, if you're not sure what diffusion is, I'll link my video up here that I've already covered on diffusion. The direction that the water moves is from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution. And that's what I've demonstrated on this diagram here. The dilute solution, there are lots of water molecules compared to only two solute molecules. In a concentrated solution, you have much fewer water molecules compared to your solute. And that could be dissolved sugar, or it could be dissolved salt, for example. And the water moves through a partially permeable membrane. And that's what this dashed line is representing. And your cells are partially permeable membranes, or the cell membranes are. And what that means is there is this surrounding layer but there's tiny holes which will selectively allow certain molecules to pass across. And in this case, water is able to pass through that membrane. So that's our definition. But you could be asked to describe the effect that osmosis has on plant material. And in this example, I've got potato cubes in three different solutions, which are all of different concentration. And we're going to look at what would happen to the potato in each of them. So the first one, we have put a potato in a concentrated solution. Now what that means is there is a more concentrated solution outside of the potato compared to inside. And therefore the water will diffuse out of the potato into the surrounding liquid. So the potato will decrease in mass because it's losing water. The next one that we have is a dilute solution. 
And this time, that would mean that if we had a really dilute solution, for example, if it was just pure water with nothing else dissolved in it, then the water would move into the potato because inside of the potato, there would be a more concentrated solution. So in that instance, the potato would actually gain mass because water is entering. In our third scenario, we have a solution which is exactly the same concentration as the inside of the cell for whichever solutes we've made it up for, whether that's sugar or salts. And if that's the case, there won't be any overall movement or net movement of water because it's already at equilibrium, or in other words, there's the same concentration inside and out. Now, one of the required practicals is linked to that, but I'm not going to go through that in detail, just very briefly to show you um, the data skills linked to this. So we've got our three solutions and we talked about which potatoes would gain mass, which would lose mass. And the one where it was in the same concentrated solution, then that wouldn't gain any mass at all. But if we want to find that out, we have to weigh the potatoes at the start, put them in the solutions, then we'd leave them for about 30 minutes. So there's time for osmosis to happen take the potatoes out and we actually have to dry the outsides because we only want to know the mass inside of the potato not any mass of the water droplets on the outside so we then tap them dry don't squeeze them but just tap them dry and re-weigh them and here i have some results and what we can see here is the change in mass at the different concentrations and this is more than the ones we saw on the diagram before now, if there's no change in mass, that means that there wasn't any overall diffusion of water. So osmosis wasn't happening. And if that's the case, we can find out on this graph what the exact concentration of the potato must be. Because where our line intercepts zero on the y-axis, which I've circled here, that means that there was no change in mass. So no water was moving in or out of the potato. And that must be because the solution the potato was in is exactly the same concentration as the potato itself. So in this example, that would mean that the potato's concentration was 40%. Now we haven't got what the solution itself was, but that is a really common question so you're looking at where there's zero change in mass that is what the concentration of your plant material is now it would actually be better to present that as the percentage change in mass and the reason for that is not all of the potatoes that we were measuring would have been exactly the same mass to begin with so to make sure it's a fair comparison we actually need to calculate the percentage change in mass. So this table shows you all the data that was collected. The initial mass of the potato before it went in the solution. The final mass of each potato cube after it had been in the solution. Then we've worked out the difference of what the change in mass was and whether it was an increase or negative indicates a decrease. And the last column is the percentage change mass. And this is the formula below for how you would calculate that. So you'd need to do the change in mass divided by the initial mass and then times by 100. And that is one of the math skills that you are expected to know. So you do need to learn that formula. In this video, we're going to be going through active transport for GCSE biology. So let's start by looking at the definition of active transport. It's the movement of substances from a dilute solution to a more concentrated solution. Or in other words, it's going against the concentration gradient. So if we have a look at this diagram over here, the dilute solution has lots of water molecules, but only two of our solute molecule. And that could be sugar, it could be salt, whatever the solute is that has dissolved. And in comparison, the concentrated solution has very little water compared to the solute available. So when we say it's going against the concentration gradient, 
we mean we're going from an area where there's very little of that solute to where there is a lot. And the way you use the term in the mark scheme is dilute solution to more concentrated solution. Now, because this is going against the concentration gradient, energy is needed to help move those molecules to the concentrated side. So that's the definition. And there are two key examples that you need to know for AQA. The first one is that active transport is how plants absorb mineral ions from the soil into their root hair cells. So the roots here on those roots, there are root hair cells, which are the cells that have that long protruding section. And the soil itself doesn't actually have a very concentrated solution of these mineral ions, especially compared to the concentration already within the cell. But the plant still needs lots of mineral ions continuously. And that's because those mineral ions are really important for the plant to be able to grow healthily. And that is why active transport occurs, to make sure those mineral ions are moved against the concentration gradient into the plant. The second example is in animals, for example, in humans in our guts. Sugar is absorbed into the bloodstream from your gut by active transport. And it's a similar idea. Even though in your gut, compared to your blood, you might have a low concentration of sugar and a high concentration of sugar in your blood, we still need to be able to move every last bit of sugar from your gut into the blood. And that's because sugar is constantly being used for respiration in your cells. And without respiration, your cells wouldn't be able to survive. Now, the final thing you could be asked linked to active transport, but also diffusion and osmosis. And if you haven't seen my two videos on those, I'll link them at the end. You could be asked to compare similarities and differences between these three. So I've got this Venn diagram just to demonstrate. So diffusion, that is how an example is how gases exchange at a leaf. Osmosis is only the movement of water and it's by diffusion. It's across a partially permeable membrane. Active transport is the only one that requires energy. It's the only one that demonstrates how mineral ions move into the root hair cell. And it's the only one that goes against the concentration gradient. So those are all our differences. Some of the similarities then, diffusion and osmosis are both passive, meaning they do not require energy. They are both also moving from a high to a low concentration. With osmosis, by high we mean a high concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. For diffusion and active transport, it involves the transport of the solute, because we said osmosis is the movement of water. And then all three of them are types of movement. So that's the only thing that all three have in common. So that is it for what you need to know about active transport. If you found this helpful, please give this video a thumbs up.